So let's meet our authors for tonight. Come on down one by one. Let's have June Sup on first, because I see you there at the bottom of the stairs. TV presenter, pundit, uh, campaigner, and author of a new book, Diversify, which looks at the number of groups, including disenfranchised men, disabled people, the LGBT community, still marginalized and stereotyped here in the UK. Next to her, we're going to have Kevin Lushing and his co-author, Mike Dunn. Kevin uh, was British light welterweight champion in 1996. Uh, his memoir, The Belt Boy, tells the story of his life and in particular, the abuse, physical from his father and sexual that he suffered growing up. Uh, Mike, his co-author, uh, former uh, sports editor of The Sun. Next, Let's have Bianca Miller Cole and her husband Byron Cole, who we can describe as serial entrepreneurs. Uh, Bianca, you may recognize as a 2014 apprentice finalist. They all know which chair to go to because we've handily put a, handily put a copy of their book on each chair. Um, their book is called Self Made and it is a toolkit for would be entrepreneurs. We'll talk about that in a little while. Next, uh, Afwa Hirsch, uh, lawyer, journalist, former Guardian correspondent, worked for Sky. Her book, Brit-ish, about uh, search for identity uh, in a society which is still here in the UK riddled with unacknowledged, um, unknowing white racism, perhaps. And finally, Hot Foot, we're delighted to see you from uh, the one show where he has been promoting the new BBC series Civilizations, which starts this evening. David Olushoga, TV presenter and historian and author of uh, Black and British, which is a history of black people in Britain. And um, uh, the uh, idea of the big read is um, to get people reading, but also to take these six books, uh, including Patterson Joseph's, which are all nonfiction. Uh, they're all written by people who are not, I think it's fair to say, full-time authors. Um, some of you do a lot of writing, but um, some of you are moonlighting from day jobs. They're all challenging. They're all, uh, they all look at uh, issues which in contemporary society are important. And there is an element of competition about this because the hope is that people will go away, read all of these books, and then by the end of this month, you have until the end of the month to vote on them, decide which one is London's favorite book by the 31st of March. So I'm sorry to do this to you, but I'm going to start by asking you to, to give us a pitch David, let's start with you. Why should people vote for your book? Well, it's a book I'm really proud of, which is not a good enough reason for you to vote for it, but uh, it's a statement of fact. To me, this book is a book that should have been written 20 years ago. It's the first time since Peter Fryer in the 80s that a proper, big, comprehensive history of the black presence in Britain and Britain's interaction with Africans on three continents has been written. And I wrote it because of the absence of other people doing it. We can't have 30-year gaps between a history this important being written. So I did it because no one else had done it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the size that it is, because it's 100,000 words over, uh, over the length that was agreed with the publisher, <laughs> because I thought, I ain't going to do it twice. <laughs> so um, the reason it will hurt your foot if it lands on it is because it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, uh, and it's written as a, as a homage to Peter Fryer's book, Staying Power, the book which changed my life and made me realize that I was part of a long history and I belong in this country. For, for those of us who haven't read it, uh, Peter Fryer's book, he was a Marxist historian, I think. He was a Marxist historian who happened to be there when the, when the Windrush arrived in Tilbury. He was a newspaper reporter, sent down Tilbury, there's a boat coming in with some Jamaicans on it, go and cover it, little story, and <laughs> wasn't. <laughs> wasn't a little story, changed his life, and he wrote a great book. And this book is a, a homage and a response to that book. Why do you think nobody had done it before? You, you say it's the, the first book since Friar in the 80s. Why had nobody done it before? Because I think we've got trapped in an idea of thinking that black British history is a specialism. It's a marginal subject. It's only of interest to black people. It's not commercially viable. And it's a sort of nice-to-have history. It's not real history. It's not the kind of proper stuff about kind of battles and 
kings and queens. It's a nice little novelty. Well, I completely disagree with that. And this book is about placing black British history as British history. It's not marginal. It's not peripheral. It is central. We have always been part of this country's story. And it's not just about the black presence in Britain. Time and time again in our history, our encounters with African people, the debates about the rights, the humanity of African people have been the big political issues of, of the day. What's the big political issue of today? It's immigration. This is all part of the same story. Our encounters with other peoples, our global reach of Britain has been the big story for, for half a millennium. Um, Bianca and Byron, tell us about Self Made, and um, you're both entrepreneurs, which I suspect means you're good at selling things. Sell us, <laughs> sell us the book. <laughs> um, so Self Made uh, was written uh, because we felt that there was a gap in the market for a book that provided information, not motivation. So I think there's a lot of books out there on the market that give you great insight into, you should do it, go and do it, but not how. So we wanted to ensure that we provided a step-by-step -step guide that kind of acted as a, a pocket mentor, you know, something that you could refer back to time and time again to give you that helpful insight into what to do to make your business commercially viable and successful. Um, but not just if you're an entrepreneur, but also just in general, I think we're currently in a society where the jobs that exist today are not necessarily the jobs of the future. So we're all self-made. You know, we all need to be taking control of our career, our business and so on. And therefore, there's chapters in the book like personal branding, networking, um, that are important to you in general. So that was why we wrote the book. One of the companies you run is, a, is the B Group, which is about personal branding, isn't it? Tell me, describe what personal branding is and why it's important. So personal branding, there's a, a quote by a chap called Guy Kawasaki, which said, um, it's... Uh, oh, the, the quote just went out of my head. <laughs> the quote is... Uh, what's that? Paraphrase. <laughs> Paraphrase. Um, so, yeah, it's not about what you say. It's about what people say about you, basically. So personal branding, you, what you do and how you deliver yourself and how you're perceived is your personal brand. And most people concentrate on how they market a product or a business or a service, but don't think about how they market themselves. So even if that's in the context of a career, you know, how are you putting yourself out there on LinkedIn? If you meet someone for the first time, how are you coming across? What's the first impression, the lasting legacy that you leave them with? It's all about understanding in your impression management. Impression management. You heard, heard the term here, in my case, for the first time. Oh, <laughs> I, uh, I really like that. Is that in the book? Uh, probably not. No. <laughs> I mean, you just, you just dreamt that up. No, I didn't, well, no, I didn't quite. <laughs> that's the second book, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the second, absolutely, that's the second book. Byron, um, I, I, I described you, the two of you, as serial entrepreneurs. What does that mean in practice? I guess a, a serial entrepreneur is anyone that has, I guess, multiple financial interests. So people who are helping grow the economy by running businesses and employing many others. So yeah, that's a short answer and for the you. businesses that you two run between you, what are they? Because there are quite a lot. Yeah. Sure. So uh, I have a construction recruitment company to give you an idea of the size in the first year. It traded several million in the first year. I have a luxury chauffeur business with, with multiple luxury cars from Rolls Royces, Bentleys and so on. We have obviously together the, the book, which um, we, we are having a tremendous feedback on. Wasn't part of the plan to have it have such a great impact on so many people, but just hearing the stories is phenomenal. Um, we get so many people emailing us, telling us their story, and that's, I guess, one of, the, one of the great parts of writing a book that has an impact on people. Running a recruitment business and a chauffeur car company, that would be enough for most people. How on earth? <laughs> How on earth did you find time to do the book? Yeah, I mean, we have a great team. I have a great team. We have a great team that allow us to do the things that we enjoy most. So I have to give credit to our team. Did the team write the book or did you leave them to run? <laughs> no, no we, unfortunately, we wrote it ourselves. Yeah, we, we did it ourselves. <laughs> All right. OK, thank you very much indeed. Afwa, um, tell us about your book. Explain um, uh, the background, why you came to write it, and tell us why that your book should be the big read of uh, London's big read this year. First of all, it's such an honor to be on a stage with these guys. Um, I never imagined that my book would become a book and that people would read it and be interested in it. Basically, I wrote this book for my younger self because when I was growing up in this country, I'm a British person, right? But I never really felt like I 
um, owned my Britishness. I didn't feel like it was an identity I could embrace, partly because I didn't see Britishness defined in a way that included me, and also because um, I think that Britishness has long been linked to whiteness in ways that many of us, like from all different backgrounds, don't understand. And in me, that triggered quite a personal crisis of identity growing up. And I overcame that crisis and went into the professions. I became a barrister. I worked in West Africa. I became a, a correspondent for The Guardian. So I was doing great, but I still saw this crisis of identity in other people around me and also playing out on, I think, a national scale. And this was before Brexit. But I started to sense that Britishness itself was an identity in crisis. I think we struggle to define what Britishness is. Many people who are British feel excluded from Britishness. And it's a very unsustainable state of affairs for us to build ourselves into a, a nation that can include its talented people, that can compete globally with other nations that have strong identities, and that can be honest about its past. Um, and the things that David was talking about in terms of our history, I'm interested in our relationship with that history and how the belief so many of us have had that we don't belong here and we don't have a history here, how that's affected our sense of who we are and others' sense of this nation. So these are the things that I explore in my book. And I tell other people's stories that really go into the heart of why Britishness is an identity in crisis. And I've also written in more personal detail than I planned about my own as well. You, you say you conceived the book before the Brexit referendum and the Brexit debate. How has that impacted, do you think, on British people's sense of their own identity? What has it done to this? Well, I think there's no doubt that Brexit has been divisive, and I think it's really shone a light on the extreme differences that exist in our interpretations of what this country means and who gets to decide its future. Um, but for me, there's nothing new in Brexit. And um, actually, it's unfortunate that I didn't publish my book before the vote because I would have predicted it. But anyway, um, I, was, I think that it really reveals that this crisis, and as I'm arguing, it's on one level, it's an emotional thing. And as I said, I wrote it for the younger me because I experienced growing up in this country without the security of feeling that I got to belong in the place that I should belong. But it also has real political consequences. You know, it's not sustainable for a nation to have this existential crisis at its core. And I think, not surprisingly, that's playing out in a very toxic way. I think a lot of current events that we're looking at are actually a battle for the soul of this country. What is its cultural core? Who belongs here? What do we actually stand for as a nation? We're fighting over that, and the fight is ugly. And it has real consequences, political, economic, social. So Brexit for me has kind of increased the odds, but it's an old issue that has been building and intensifying over, well, certainly my whole lifetime. You used the word toxic. Um, was it inevitable that um, having a debate about Britain's place in the world would produce that kind of toxic reaction? Um, I've, I have to admit, I've been surprised by the level of... Um, hostility and defensiveness that exists in the debate. And if I just talk about my book, the reaction to my book has, on the whole, been incredible and humbling. But there have been, um, among the establishment, especially uh, people who have not criticized my book, because that's fine when you write a book, you want people to engage with it and criticize it and argue about it. I wanted to start a conversation. But I didn't expect people to question my right to have a view. And some of the um, response has been people saying, brown girl know your place you don't get to have a view on this country this isn't your country and it's so interesting because ironically for them they've become really great case studies for my thesis um, <laughs> and in some cases boosted my book sales with their kind of reaction but but I have to say it surprised me and I think I underestimated um, the extent to which people would feel hostile not just about what I'm arguing but the argument coming from somebody who looks like me um, Kevin, uh, Afwa says that her book tells more about her than she originally intended. You set out to write a book deliberately that was extraordinarily revealing and uh, personal. Belt Boy, tell us why we should read it. Well, for me, the Belt Boy is a personal um, account of my lives and the trials and tribulations growing up. I mean, the early 80s in Britain. So I had that racial tension that I felt growing up. So boxing for me was a way of channeling my aggression into something that I was good at. And when I was growing up in the early 80s and even 70s, um, we wasn't encouraged to do other sports and other stuff. So 
boxing was for me. I was just born up that way. Um, but it's a personal... <sighs> being up here and talking about it is quite hard for me to talk about because I... Yeah, Mike, mm -hmm. Mike you co-wrote it. Yeah, I co... Sorry, I'm not used to this sort of thing. I co-wrote uh, the book. I know that, that you're going to hear a lot from Kevin, and quite rightly so, but he's not very good at explaining the real reason or what the Belt Boy is all about. The Belt Boy is ultimately, and this is why you should vote for it, uh, a story about courage. <laughs> it's also available on Amazon. And <laughs> um, it's a story about courage. And basically, Kevin, when he was a fighter, fought with the initials NSPCC uh, embroidered down his shorts. But he could never find, I don't know what, the courage perhaps then to explain why he did that. Nobody knew why, he just did it, and no one, no one bothered really asking. It's taken him 37 years to explain the reasons why, and the reasons why was because he, he suffered appalling abuse as a child, the worst kind of abuse you can, you can really think of. Uh, he had a father who beat him to a pulp, uh, but, I mean, not like an ordinary slapping, a real pummeling that no one should endure, never mind a child. Um, <laughs> And then when he was 10 years old, a paedophile spotted him and did the classic grooming and did everything everyone here could imagine. And Kevin absorbed all that. He couldn't tell anybody. He couldn't tell uh, his parents because he had no relationship with them. He was frightened. And inevitably, he was slipping out into truancy and into a bad way of life. And boxing somehow gave him a little lifeline, but it was only so he could escape his own home. He went along to a gym was comfortably the youngest and the weediest uh, child there, but did it to escape his father, basically, and showed potential. The Belt Boy's also about the scars of abuse and how, I think if there are parents in here, parents and adults often say, oh, they're only a child, they'll get over it. Well, I realized, speaking to Kevin 37 years later, the child never gets over it at all. And the whole way that the... the the adult emerges and grows up, is affected by what happened to him as a 10-year-old boy. Um, so these are the reasons why you should look at the Belt Boy. On the surface, it's a story about boxing, about a heroic uh, achievement because he became a British welterweight champion and he fought for a world title. But it's also about struggling against the scars of something horrific and about the relationship between a father uh, and a son. Kevin, you, you kept this to yourself, as Mike says. You found it very difficult to explain why you carried the, the initials NSPCC on your, on your shorts. Um, why, why now? Why, what, what has changed that you feel able to talk about this, to write about this now? Well, one of the reasons is because when I was boxing, um, I never wanted anyone to have that be the reason. I wanted to be, for people to talk to me about what I've achieved. So I didn't want to be someone like the headlines being the abused boxer or the child. I just, it would have taken away, you know, the stigma attached, what's attached to being boxing. You have to be hard. You have to, this is boxing. There was no, under the fittest or the fittest shall survive. And for me, for me to talk about box, my abuse, it, it, would, it would draw the wrong attraction. And I didn't want that. And waiting so long, I just wanted my kids to be old enough so when they do read it, they'll be able to understand. Um, Oh. Built 21 and 24, respectively. So, yeah. <laughs> so, it's a bit different in talking about subjects like, especially for a boxer, it's probably the hardest because we're meant to hold our feelings up in. And, and when you're a parent, and I only knew what was what my dad done to me was so wrong, was because when I had my child, mm. I realized that love, love is what love does. And love doesn't create pain. Love doesn't, love should create security and protection and I was, was the opposite and the reason why the NSPCC was on my shorts because I, won, I was about 20 and I remember seeing something in it at Christmas and it was to do with it and I saw a little boy in a, in a corner he was crying and it resonated with me and I just I wanted that and when I used to fight I used to donate money to them and when I be, become an agent for fighters like Chris Eubanks, Nigel Ben, I used to get them to donate their money to the NSPCC but never say what it was for it was just it's something, it was like my little pack. So when I did write the book, this book isn't just for me. It's for every child that's been abused, every kid that ha wanted to pick up that phone and say, look, I'm hurting, please help me. That was, that was PR for them.
the, I, I'm treading on thin ice here, but and uh, this may be a bit neat, but do you think that the, the suffering you endured as a child made you a better or more aggressive fighter? See, that's a hard one when people ask me. It's like saying, yeah, in a sick way it probably did because I was familiar with pain from a very early age and I knew how to discipline myself for, from that kind of like abuse. But the scars that it's left for me, they never go away. That that they're in your brain. I can picture any minute you want in that abuse, I can tell you where it was. You never forget. You just put it into your subconsciousness. So fighting was a way of me, that would be my father if I'm hitting someone in the ring, if that, or the, the paedophile that groomed me for like two years. These are all trials and tribulations through my whole life, and it never leaves you, ever. Okay, Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, June, come to you, diversity. Um, in some ways, covering... Diversify. Diversify, I beg your pardon. Di it's the difference of only one letter. Uh, <laughs> but it makes all the difference, sweetie. <laughs> Diversify, which covers some of the same territory, perhaps, as Afua's book. Um, sell your book to us. Yes, sure. Uh, so the book uh, is about the social, moral, and economic benefits uh, of diversity. Uh, and it looks at diversity from a very broad spectrum. Uh, so I look at various disenfranchised groups uh, that I call the others uh, in the book. Uh, that's disenfranchised men, uh, women, uh, gender in general, uh, LGBTQ, um, disability, uh, um, age um, and class, obviously, being in the UK. And I think really what made me decide to write the book uh, was an incident that happened to me. So like most uh, British television talent, you know, us those of us that moonlight. <laughs> um, I uh, moved to America uh, with the hope of cracking the holy grail of, you know, cracking America. And uh, one day I was filming on set in Las Vegas and a young man appeared who was covered head to toe in tattoos. And I immediately felt uncomfortable around him and nervous. And if I'm honest, um, somewhat frightened of him. And he hadn't behaved aggressively or in a menacing way or anything like that. And he could sense how uncomfortable I was. And therefore, he was going out of his way to try and be polite and not seem threatening. And I thought, wow, how hard is it going to be for him to be all he can be if even I am uncomfortable with him? And in that moment, I was able to see this issue from both perspectives because as a black woman, uh, as a working class woman, I've also been dis disabled, so I tick quite a few boxes. Um, I'm, I, I'm working on gay, that's coming up, so I'll be looking. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I'll be taking some numbers after tonight. Um, and so, <laughs> and so, so I'd always looked at this issue as being on the receiving end. And in that moment, I was able to see it from both perspectives, and I wanted to start a conversation. And I think what this is really about is much like what Afwa talks about in, in British and, and also what you talk about, David, is about the kind of country we want to create. And I think Brexit, obviously I'm a Remainer and, and I'm totally against Brexit, but what it does is it does offer, offer us an opportunity in terms of looking at groups and communities who have been ignored, groups who have not been allowed to fulfill their potential that we can now invest in. And all of the evidence shows us that this is good for business, it's good for society. And actually, the country that gets this right, that's the country that can really lead the world. And I think we all have our part to play. So often we look at this issue as, you know, being on the receiving end, but actually, how are you perpetuating the status quo? What are you doing to change things? And so the book is very prescriptive. I worked with Oxford University and the LSE, so there's lots of data, there's lots of research, um, and then there's clear steps on how you can better connect with the other and change society and create a world that's fairer for all of us. So world, that's it. A world that's fairer for all of us, I can see that that's a benefit, but you, you seem to be saying that the benefits for society and possibly the economy too yeah. are more than just that. Yeah. Explain, yeah. explain how that works. Yeah, totally. So um, one of the things that uh, I did was partnered with the LSE, so we actually calculated the cost of discrimination, uh, which is £127 billion a year. That's a lot of money. And, and think of what that could do for our economy. And when you look at it, all of the evidence shows in business that when you have diverse teams, 
the bottom line increases, which is why what's interesting in terms of the people that responded to the book, businesses have really taken this book on board, which I'm so excited by, because they're able to see quickly the benefits. In terms of ethnic diversity, your bottom line is increased by a third. In terms of gender diversity, your bottom line in a lot of cases has actually doubled. So to me, it's a no-brainer. This isn't altruism. This is just smart business sense. And actually, it's so, it makes sense in terms of society and obviously economically as, as well. So, yeah. you, 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 like Afua, mentioned Brexit. Let me ask you the sort of same sort of question I asked mm. her. Are you surprised, shocked? What is your reaction to the nature of the sort of Brexit debate? Well, well I was on the board of the Remain campaign. Not that it helped, but, you know, we tried. God bless us. Um, I think we were all in our bubble. The night before Brexit, we actually had a dinner. We had a celebration dinner. We thought we had it in the bag. Um, and it was, oh, you should have seen the faces. So <laughs> when Sunderland came in, we're like, oh, this isn't going how we planned. And then more started coming in. And it was like, wow. And the thing was, although the polling suggested that we were going to win, everybody thought that was what was going to happen. And so for me, I was surprised that the vote went the way it did. But then after, when I started exploring and looking at the, the reasons why people voted leave, I wasn't surprised at all. And I think in terms of the xenophobia that's reared its ugly head since Brexit, part of the reason is because with the PC debate, what we did was we changed behavior, but we didn't necessarily change hearts and minds. And I think the next piece of this has to be about changing hearts and minds so that when there is an economic downturn, you can't have a demagogue that sort of turns up and is able to manipulate people. Um, so that's got to be the next piece. And that's the only thing that makes it sustainable. David, uh, what's your perspective on this as, as an historian? On this, on what is, on what, what the Brexit debate seems to have unlocked uh, in public discourse. Well, I think it shows a lot of us were living in a in a delusion. We we were in our bubbles. We talk a lot of, uh, these days about uh, uh, insularity and bubbles, but I think it revealed more than that. I think it revealed what happens in a country where seventy five percent of the press is owned by six oligarchs, and it shows what happens when our debate isn't about the things in front of us. That debate wasn't about the European Union. That debate was about the thing I was talking about, about what does it mean to be British. I don't remember a discussion about the common agricultural policy or about fisheries, and I was on Newsnight a couple of times discussing Brexit. We did discuss the European Union. It wasn't about the European Union. It was about what is the role of this country, what are we, who are we, what defines Britishness. And as Afua says, this is unsustainable. Brexit is a is a byproduct of the fact that our nation's sense of itself, really since the loss of empire, hasn't stabilized. And I think, as a historian, until we actually accept what our role in, in the world was, I don't think we're going to find a new one that makes sense for everybody and that's comfortable. Anybody else want to come in on this? Because it's something in which, obviously, Afua, June, and David have, have thought. Do you two, um, do you steer well clear of politics? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kevin? <you can>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll leave the politicians to <laughs> we'll leave the politicians to, uh, politics to the television personalities and the journalists, uh, which is clearly where it belongs. Um, this is an event about reading. Let me ask you all about reading and about books. Um, how central, June, starting with you, how central is reading and, and our books? To your life? Is it something that um, they're nice to have, but um, you're too busy with uh, the, all the other things that go on in <laughs> one's life? Or are you a dedicated reader? Uh, yes, I, I love reading. Um, though I'm to ask instantly because I realise now nobody is going to say no, no. I'm not a dedicated no, no, I'm going to be honest. in an environment like no, no, this no. no no I'm going to be absolutely honest uh, no I love reading uh, though I'll be honest I, I now sort of download audible books probably more um, just because it means that you know I'm a woman I like to multitask so you know I can be jogging and have a book in my ears or you know cooking and be listening to one so uh, yeah so I am now a bit of a audible geek as a, as a child growing up, mm. what were the books that m meant most to you? Oh, for sure. Um, I know why the cage bird sings. I think um, that book uh, completely changed my perspective of 
of being a, a young black girl, I think. Um, it was just such a wonderful book. It's so beautifully written. And it just takes you into another world, but a world that you can relate to. Um, so that was my book um, as a child. Um, though I wish I had had the Gruffalo, because I read that to my nieces and nephew. So I wish that had been around when I was growing up. Kevin, uh, what about you? I read somewhere that, that one of, you said to one interviewer that one of the reasons why you felt able to write this book was that you had read other books by other people who'd gone through perhaps similar things. And that hearing them tell their tales made you feel that perhaps you could tell yours. Is that right? Yeah, I think I was a bit more comfortable when you hear Tyson or other tough people going through abuse as an early age. And you, you, especially in sport and especially boxing, which, because it comes from the grassroots and it's a very working class sport, it, it comes hand in hand, some kind of a abuse or pain growing up. So yeah, I, I, listening to Tyson or even Sugar Ray Leonard, talking about their abuse since they, they grew up. Yeah, it made me a bit more comfortable and a bit more human um, talking about such a serious subject. But there's one thing talking about it, and there's another writing a book, which oh, is presumably where Mike comes in. Yeah, if, uh, listen, Mike, me and him known each other for about 15 years, and I always said to him, well, we used to do a lot of business together when I used to look after favourites footballers and um, boxers would do stories, and I'd say, listen, in about when you retire, you can write my book. So over that 14 years, he'd, he'd, I'd built up that kind of trust with him um, to talk about really deep subjects and stuff. So yeah, I, I was just lucky to find a decent ghostwriter who could poetically book what I felt, not what, what, I, what I said, but he could, what I feel in, into words, which is, you know, quite unique. Mike, Mike, how does this relationship work? How do you think yourself into it. somebody else's? <laughs> <laughs> you hide it well. How does it work? Uh, the way we wrote the book, I mean, we'd known each other, as Kevin says, for a long time. The way we wrote, we live some distance apart, so we actually did the entire book over the phone, which doesn't sound ideal, and ordinarily I don't suppose would be ideal, but we knew each other. I didn't need to see uh, the look in his face or the look in his eyes, because I could sort of sense it over the phone in any case. You have to remember that I actually had no idea what this book was going to be about. You know, he was a, a boxer. He hinted that there was a little bit more to it than that, but I had no idea whatsoever. The, no, none, none, none whatsoever. Um, and I, it, the way I found out was by asking the obvious questions. You, you know, you're doing someone's life story, so inevitably you say, you know, where were you born? Where did you live? What did your parents do? What kind of childhood did you have? And slowly but surely, it started to, to, to sort of ooze out. At, at what moment, what was the moment when you realised that actually this was not just going to be another boxer's memoir? He told me quite early on, because when you think about it, it's one of the early questions you ask about, you know, their childhood. He told me about this beating he'd suffered uh, one particular occasion, which was a beating of a lifetime, quite frankly, um, to sort of get to the nub of it. It ended up with Kevin stripped naked, eight, nine, ten, nine years old, uh, on a freezing night, very much like the weather, very much like this, thick, thick snow outside. And his father dragged him outside, stripped him naked, uh, went into uh, their shed or whatever, and, and dragged out a pair of uh, jump leads, but not the sort of jump leads you use to start a car. Uh, these were heavy duty ones you use for uh, lorries or, or big vehicles, and started beating the living daylights out of him, blood, you know, cutting him, he was on the floor shivering, uh, it just it, it completely inhuman. And that story came early on. Uh, but even that sort of paled into insignificance compared to when the, the, the paedophile sort of appeared on the scene uh, when he was 10. And the, the, the sort of most memorable thing for me in his telling of that was... His voice literally rose very, uh, uh, how many octaves, I don't know. But suddenly I was hearing a different pitch to his voice. And I realized he was 10 years old all over again on the other end of the phone. And he was literally reliving everything. He wasn't talking to me as, as Kevin, age 40, whatever. He, he was, he's putting his hand on me now. It was, it was taught like that. I'm not a, a psychiatrist and I can't analyze these things. But that's how he told me the story. Kevin, did it, did it help that you were doing this on the phone? No, <laughs> no when, I, when I knew he was calling me on certain subjects, I'd say to him, right, don't call me. 
until this time, okay? And I'm going to give you 45 minutes. Don't quote me on anything. Just listen, get the tape recorder on, and let me just get through it. And I would psych myself up. So that would be the same psych. I would set me up, myself up for fights. So when I used to go for world title fights, I'd be in my room, and they would come in and write, say, 10 minutes, champ, and then I'd get back. That anxiety that I had, was the same anxiety I used to have when my dad used to say to me, right, go and get me a belt to beat you with. That, that anxiety of walking to the ring was the same anxiety that I had when I was 10 years old. Like, <sighs> what's going to happen? Not what's going to happen. But, and that's, I never knew what that was until I became a professional fighter. That anxiety was what I was when I was back 10 years old, going for my dad or coming home from school and worried about, is his car going to be there? And so I'd look around the corner and think, <sighs> that is the same anxiety or the same feeling I had walking to the ring 30 years later. It never left me, and I never knew what it was until I had, I had counselling in America many years ago. So it was really therapeutical, but I wouldn't encourage anyone to do it because it nearly... Sometimes it can break you talking about your life 30 years. Like It doesn't matter where you are. You know how strong you are, what champion you've won. I've won world titles and British titles. <laughs> Talking about it again is just going back. So even here today, I'll, I'll walk out of here and I'll go into myself, I'll go into a corner and I'll just reminisce of something that I can't get out of my brain. And I don't want you to feel sorry for me because I'm really strong and I know what I'm doing now. But I just want you to take pity when you do see them kids or you, it happens. It could happen to anyone that you know and that we do, whether I suffer now or, and suffer 40 years ago, it, it's out there. Okay. Afwa. Let me ask you about, about reading, and reading as a, as a child, what, what, what got you started? What were the books that really stood out for you? Um, I was a complete bookworm as a child, and I think actually in hindsight it's partly to do with just being such a misfit in my environment. I, was, I didn't really um, fit in, and I was very conscious of not fitting in, so I, um, I kind of immersed myself in books. So the books that I first got into, Nancy Drew, read every single Nancy Drew book. Um, I read every Roald Dahl book. I just read everything I could get my hands on. And those books, I think, instilled a lifelong love of reading. But at the same time, there was no one in any of those books that looked like me. Oh, I forgot Sweet Valley High, every Sweet Valley High book. Uh, <laughs> I think about that because I was in LA. And when I was in LA, I was like, where do my ideas about LA come from? And I realized Sweet Valley High, California. Um, there was nobody in those books who looked like me or had names that sounded like mine or whose mother made the kind of food that my mother made. You know, these things that just... Um, so on one level, they provided me with a refuge from my issues, but on another, they highlighted my difference. It was only when I got a bit older I started reading books by black authors, and then um, one of the first I read was Cry the Beloved Country. I didn't know anything about apartheid until I read that book. So that was like... Um, I was about 10 or 11 um, it really kind of changed my whole perspective. Uh, I read everything Toni Morrison wrote, and I still read everything she writes. And if I were to credit one author with kind of building my emotional inner world, I would say Toni Morrison had a huge impact on me. But then these were books about other countries. These were books about African-Americans or South Africa. I read Amata Odu and Chinua Achebe. Um, but they didn't reflect my reality as a black British person. And so I think that stayed with me, that sense that we don't get to tell our stories. And, you know, um, when I was growing up, there weren't kids in British books who looked like me, and there weren't adults who had lives like mine that um, I could read. And that's changing now. I mean, this, this year's been like a bumper crop, you know. Rainy Edo Lodge written her book, June's written her book, David's written his book, um, and there was some personal stuff in David's book, which I which touched me so much and I related to so much of it. And it's quite hard to um, it, tell it your own story. It changed a while ago, didn't, though, didn't it? I mean, Zadie Smith, for instance, comes to mind. There are, yeah. there, are uh, there have been for perhaps 20, 25 years British writers of colour who have reflected that diversity and that, the, 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 that, that uh, not many, but, but there But think have about Zadie. So Zadie, like, when White Teeth came out, it was a huge deal because there hadn't been a book like that. There had been a mass publication before so you know the fact that that her book felt like such a turning point um and still a lot of the books that we write you know I'm thinking of Small Island or um you know I read I still read 
widely British authors, but they're often not about the black British experience or like me, someone of mixed heritage growing up in this country. You know, just the range of our experiences. I think we still sometimes suffer from this single narrative. And I do think it's changing. And that's really good. But I think it would have been, and my daughter now is six and reads children's books and they're so different. They are so different. And that gives me so much joy. And she's growing up with the normality that when she reads books, there are people who look like her and have names like hers and that it's kind of normalized. So I think that things are changing, but I, through my journey and her journey, I can see um, how important it is and how much difference it makes. Byron and Bianca, we were talking earlier and you told me, you were telling me about your school days and both of you were selling things um, at the age of <laughs> to, to your parents or to your school friends, <laughs> more or less, as soon as you could walk. Did it leave any time for reading? I guess in my early days, I didn't read so much. I think post 18 is when I really started to read. Um, so I now read a lot of books. Like June, mine are mostly audio. And, and probably I get through an audio book once a week, once a fortnight, uh, and I just buy something new every fortnight. So, what, what sort of stuff? I read things like um, a lot of self-help books, time management books, entrepreneurship, um, things like that. Really, sales related. Um, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sales related. Yeah, thanks for that. That's okay. Yeah, and Bianca's the opposite, I guess. You, you was a bookworm. Yeah, so I um, I loved books. I couldn't, similar to you, I couldn't get enough and uh, used to really irritate my parents by on the kind of Tesco shop going and picking up a book and then reading it in two days and being like, so I need another one. <laughs> so that was kind of my journey. But it was, you know, Jacqueline Wilson. I loved Jacqueline Wilson books. Um, I loved Roald Dahl. I loved uh, Harry Potter. Just anything that was available, I was probably reading. Um, did, did you yeah. feel, as Afua did, that um, they were great stories, but there wasn't anyone like you in them? I, I have to be honest, I never felt like that, because I didn't, I, I didn't feel I needed representation in the books that I read in order to feel confident within myself. I think my, my surroundings, my family and so on, gave me that confidence and that knowledge and sense of self and uh, knowledge of my history that I didn't feel I needed to see someone like me to feel like I could be a part of that book or that journey. So I, I, don't, I don't feel like that, no. But it would have been nice. And like I know my parents went out of their way to get me a black Barbie at one point because, <laughs> because, because of the issues you face, you know, having a... You know, having a white Barbie and a white Ken and being like, okay, well, you know, this is good. And they're not, <laughs> not having one. But it, it, it wasn't a feeling like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do because I don't have that representation. I, I feel like I still had a very wholesome upbringing and um, had great awareness and had great books to read. David, I would, I would hazard that you, like Afua, were a bookish youth. Um, I'm, I'm severely dyslexic, so I wasn't. Um, I learned to read because my mother taught me because my schools mm -hmm. failed and uh, learned late so it was a teenager that I started to read and we had no money so I read the books that were in my our house so I read the books that um, my mother read and I read the books that my father had brought from Nigeria Chinua Achebe and Wale Shuyinku and others so I came to reading really really profoundly late I mean if it wasn't for computers and spell checks I wouldn't be writing books I'd be yeah. asking if you want fries with that so um, not not what people imagine, um, but um, you know, when it when when I started to read, um, then I never stopped. And uh, do you now find it um, when, having learned, having overcome that dyslexia, is it still an ongoing problem? Or do you do you now find it much easier? It's relevant because of computers. The dyslexia was a problem in a world that was born in the idea of the medieval scribe. It was about your handwriting. It was about repeatability of letters, repetition of um, forms. Dyslexia was a disadvantage in that world. It's an active advantage in the world that we live in now. I'm very happy to be dyslexic. I really wasn't at, at uh, seven or eight at school when I couldn't read and I was in the class with the kids who couldn't speak English who just got off the boats from Vietnam. Then it wasn't great, but it, it's irrelevant now. Um, and dyslexia has lots of advantages, um, which in, in this new world, I think, can outweigh 
not for everybody, but can outwear the disadvantages. Yes, I mean, I, 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 this may again be too simple, too neat, but does the fact that you went into television, is that a, partly a reflection of that? Is yeah, it's, it's visual. I mean, I, I became a good television director because I found the visual side of it, the aptitude, um, was there automatically. Now, that could be dyslexia-related, it might not be, but um, things that a lot of people found more difficult, um, I found quite easy. But... When we talk about, I mean, June's book, um, book on diversify, I'm sure, having been in America, she'll talk about cognitive diversity. I mean, the, the most forward-looking American companies are thinking, well, we've got to make sure someone on our board's on the autistic spectrum. Yeah. We've got Particularly to, the tech companies. Yeah, yeah. Where's, where's our yeah. dyslexic yeah. CEO? Yeah. They are really yeah. thinking yeah. about this cognitive diversity. Totally. So I feel, I feel um, blessed. Um, Do you have advice for young people now growing up like you have dyslexia, or the parents of young people, are there are there uh, are there things you would recommend that they should do, an approach they should take, or or are, are people very different? Or they may have dyslexia, but they're all very different. Their approach is different. It varies enormously, but I, what I would challenge is the idea that it's a learning difficulty. It is a difficulty in certain certain areas of traditional schooling which are increasingly less and less relevant yeah. and it's an active as june will know better than yeah. me it's an active advantage in some areas yeah. and i would tell my kids if they if i discovered they're dyslexic that so was leonardo da vinci yeah. didn't hold him back uh, indeed indeed all right i'm going to ask you all just one last question and then we'll wrap this up and um i want you please they've had no warning of this i want you please to recommend one book that everybody in this room should read, other than your own, obviously. <laughs> June. Okay, uh, so this is a very, I give this book to um, uh, all my friends, or anybody, actually. It's one of those books I always have in my bag, so you should read this. Um, uh, it's by a man called Glenn Clark. Uh, it was written, I think, in 1929, uh, and it's called um, The Man Who Tapped the Secrets of the Universe. Um, and it's a small book. It will take you literally not even a day to read it. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful book uh, uh, about uh, a man called Walter Russell, uh, who was able to get to the top of five very different industries um, using uh, the power of connecting with source. Um, so it's quite spiritual. Um, but for anybody who has a dream that they want to achieve, um, I would say this is a book you should read. Kevin? Uh, that's a bit old-fashioned. Um, mine's going to be Martin Luther King. Um, I don't know why I say it. Maybe because I used to look up to him and, and, and his trials and tribulations, what he went through when it was um, the civil rights. And as someone that, as of growing up in the early 80s, he was someone I always looked up to. And when I, when I, I suffered from being dyslexic as well. When, it, when I was growing up, it wasn't that word. It was just you were thick and you just stayed at the back of the class. And I didn't understand stand this word dyslexic. So when I did begin to uh, learn how to read, that was one of the best books I've ever read. Mike? I kind of feel uh, honour bound to mention a, a sports book just simply because he's a boxer and I've reported on sport for a long time. My favourite sports book is one that surprised me because I'm not really a tennis fan, I'm a football fan. And boxing, of course. Uh, but my favourite sports book is Andre Agassi, uh, a book called uh, Open. You may remember, he, he was, for me, he was just a player who turned up at Wimbledon, and you sometimes heard of him in the US Open. Um, and that's all I knew about him. He wasn't a hero of mine at all. Uh, but his book, I think, is a, a masterclass of, of sports writing. On the one hand, it's genuinely revelatory. You, it's full of surprises, stuff you just couldn't have imagined about him. Not least he hated tennis, and I never even knew that. Um, all the struggles he had, all the demons he had within himself. But he also used, um, he collaborated with a, a ghostwriter who is so famous, I can't remember his name, an American ghostwriter, but a clearly a highly stylized writer who had a really beautiful way of stringing words together uh, and spoke with a lot of creativity. So it's not just a sort of typical sportsman without being patronizing there's a lot of beauty in the writing as well as a lot as well as a lot of uh, revelation so yeah i think that's my american thing okay thank you for that afwa can i cheat and have a fiction and a non-fiction all right okay you can cheat so if i were to um i'm going to go a bit left field with my non-fiction because um 
I guess I'm trying to think of a book that maybe everyone here won't have read. And by the way, I've learned a lot from the books I've read from the people on the panel. So you should definitely read those. Uh, but you can still vote for me. Um, <laughs> but the book that I've learned a lot from recently that's on my mind at the moment is The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. It's just the most remarkable book. And I learned so much from it. It's about the great migration in America. It's just the most remarkable piece of history, social history. Um, and kind of it just made so many things that I half understood make sense amazing book you have to read it it's quite long but worth it uh for fiction i've just finished reading nede nedi arokafor um um who fears death since we're all having quite a black panther moment at the moment this is one of the best afro sci-fi i'm really into afro sci-fi um it's just remarkable it's a dystopian book about a post-apocalyptic future in africa and about a young woman who has these incredible supernatural powers but it's amazing and I just found out that she's actually going, I think she's now, her movie rights has been bought and James Cameron's directing or something. So it's going to be a major movie, but read it before the movie hype and read more Afro sci-fi because it's cool. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Byron? Um, Simon Sinek, start with why. Yeah. So it's pretty much about having a purpose. So a lot of people start business to make money. People don't really buy into that. They buy into your purpose. So once you have a purpose, it makes growing, scaling, and making your business a lot more successful, a lot easier. So that's probably my, my favorite book. Okay. Bianca? Um, I think uh, Sheryl Sandberg, Lean In. I think it's a fantastic book, not only from a female empowerment perspective, but also to encourage anyone uh, to, to understand the importance of having a voice and making sure you have a seat at the table. And I think until you get to that point where you're contributing, you can't complain. That's kind of my feeling about it. And I, I think I took a lot away from that book. And, and I'm cheating. Can I add one? Yeah, yeah, you can. She had right, one. Yeah, you can. Um, <laughs> and uh, Brian Tracy, Eat That Frog. Um, so it's a book, it's a time management book fundamentally, but it just talks about doing the hardest things first and not having amazing to-do lists, which I do sometimes, and ticking off the easy bits to make yourself feel good about your day. <laughs> it's about kind of doing the hardest thing and taking the ball by the horns and getting on with it. So I think he's fantastic. We're not allowed to tick off the easy ones. I thought we that was are, the whole point no, of those well, lists. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, we have a, there's, a, there's a section in the book called Power Moves. It's about doing something that's going to be most impactful and influential on the course of your journey, you know, in your business or whether that's personally. And so for Brian Tracy, you look at goals and time management, you know, ticking off the good things, the easy things makes you feel good. But actually, have you done the thing that's going to be most significant to you? OK. And finally, David, one book. Well, uh, two, two at a pinch since <laughs> two of your I fellow panelists have gone to. OK, well, well, how about a book that is in itself two books, which is the autobiography of Malcolm X, which isn't an autobiography. It's a collaboration. Um, it's a book with an introduction, which is in itself a, a self-contained book and I know I think it is one of the the most eloquent um, biographies of a man and of a nation. Okay. Anyway, I hope you were taking notes. I hope you've written all those down. David, David, Bianca, Byron, Afwa, Mike, Kevin, June. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Our authors will be upstairs if you want to buy and read their books. And remember, if you read the books, you can vote on which one you think should be London's Big Read on the website by the end of this month. If you want to read the books and buy the books, they are on sale upstairs and the authors will be signing them. Upstairs, first floor, at the front of the building, but let the authors get there first. Thank you very much indeed to everybody. Thank you. <laughs>